All right, Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you, can you tell my audience what a positive psychology expert is? Of course. Thanks for having me, by the way. I so appreciate yeah. the great work you do. Uh, so, a positive, so positive psychology is really the study in science of what makes life worth living. So it's the science of happiness. And they've, um, positive psychology has been around for about 20 years, probably two decades. It is all about the relationship between happiness and success. So does happiness, you know, um, come from success? Does success lead to happiness? Or quite possibly, does happiness lead to success? And of course, we know based on lots of evidence that happiness is very good for your success. It leads to success. Yeah, this is such a uh, a concept that's so against the normal thoughts of success. We think I have to grind. I got to be serious. I got to take this seriously. Like I'll sleep when I'm dead. Like my relationships are all going to fall apart. Like nobody's going to stop me. Get out my way. Watch out. Here I come world. Yes. Right? And there's no room for happiness. It's grind time, baby. And what have you found in research? What yeah, have you found? Not so much. I mean, you know, of course, things require energy and they require dedication and commitment. But for the most part, you know, the things that we think will lead to happiness don't, right? Or at least they don't lead to as much happiness and uh, doesn't lead to a happiness that lasts as long as we might expect it to. So for instance, most of us think that, of course, that money leads to happiness, but we found that not to be true. Um, yes, if you're making 10000 you make 20000 it's going to increase your subjective well-being. Um, but eventually you experience what's called diminishing marginal utility of the dollar, which means that with every additional dollar above about $75,000, you get less and less happiness for each dollar. No right? way. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting. And at some point you actually tap out, and you don't really get any additional happiness for each additional dollar. So, you know, money for a large, to a large extent doesn't lead to increasing happiness unless you're living at below a level of subsistence, meaning you can't pay your bills. It's, it's about $75,000. Wow. Um, yeah. It's pretty fascinating, right? Just that alone. Yeah, absolutely. Because everybody thinks I'll be happy when, right? I'll be happy when I'm rich. I'll be happy when I'm famous. I'll be happy when I'm skinny. I'll be happy when I'm strong, right? Oh, so what well, are we're not kids, right? I mean, same thing with marriage and kids. I think most of us have been disabused of that notion and idea by now. But for the most part, when you get married, you experience a small bump in your happiness during that little honeymoon period. And you quickly return to your baseline levels. And sometimes below that, as the marriage continues on, right? Same thing with kids is that with the first kid, surprisingly enough, you actually re um, experience um, lower happiness, less happiness as a result of the first kid. It's not statistically significant. With the second kid, though, it is statistically significant. So you get a much bigger hmm. sort of decrease in your happiness and your happiness ratings don't return to their baseline levels until those kids leave the house, right? Really? So most of the things that we think will lead to happiness simply doesn't. Wow. Well, I have four kids. So like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to tell you that they want to tell you how cute it is, but I'm like, it's really hard. <laughs> it's you not like, uh, what's that? And I said, you just nailed it. You know, um, I think for the most part, parents are surprised, um, you know, by this finding on one level, especially if they're new parents. Um, but the stress and the anxiety and the responsibility that comes with kids is a lot. We wouldn't give our kids back, of course. We wouldn't want right. to give our kids back. We would do anything for our kids. That being said, most of us would attest to the fact that, you know, kids don't necessarily enhance your overall happiness because it comes with a lot of stress and anxiety and worry because you love them. Wow. So what things have you found actually do enhance your happiness? Yeah. So, you know, positive psychology has basically found a, or discovered a formula for happiness, and it consists of really three elements. Um, the first element is really genes. So 50% of our happiness is actually um, based on our genetic code, on our DNA. So wow. a we have a predisposition to be a little happy, a little happier, a little less happy. The interesting thing about, thing about that 50%, though, is that it's malleable, meaning that you can change it. So it's not like eye color or height. You can actually improve your happiness just by applying a few simple tips, tricks, or tools. Um, so that's 50% of it. So it's changeable. There's 10% of it. And the 10% of it is what most of us give most of our time, energy, and attention to. 10% of it is conditions and circumstances of your life. So when most of us think about improving our life, we think about these conditions. That's the mm -hmm. money you make, who you're dating, who you're married to, your kids, your health, all these things. All together, the most perfect life only makes up for about 10% of your overall happiness. 10%. So if you have the ideal life, making the ideal amount of money, you have the ideal partner, the ideal kids, all of that still only a trip or accounts for 10% of your happiness. The wow. other 40% is mostly voluntary activities, right? So relationships, of course, are at the top of that, social support, but also things like 
optimism and gratitude and resilience and things of that nature. And so most of your happiness, at least 90%, I would argue that 100%, but about 90% of your happiness from a scientific perspective is totally within your control. Wow. Beautiful. And I have definitely lived through this. I've lived a couple different lifetimes in my life. One where I was very much out of my power. And I think a lot of people have come, gone through this. I feel like there's a bit of a global awakening going on right now. So people are starting to understand these concepts. I mean, even the fact that you are a positive psychology expert, you have a master's degree in this says a lot about how far we're coming and how much everyone's waking up. So a lot of us have lived this life where we thought outside circumstances would dictate our happiness. And we found that wasn't the way. And then we started <laughs> doing our meditation and we started doing our gratitude and we started reading good books and expanding our minds and taking accountability. And we watch that happiness. It, it's to the point that it feels like you are almost invincible once you get far enough into this positive psychology game, because you realize that everything's happening for you. So even when you have a setback, you're like, Ooh, what am I going to learn from this? Um, so can you, okay. I want to back up a little bit because so DNA is something that I do with my clients. I love talking about DNA and epigenetics. I actually had a DNA expert um, from the Mayo Clinic, come on the podcast and talk about um, genetics. So I'm curious, like, what do you, could you share any details on that of, of genes of like why you're seeing such a, a, yeah. a huge component or correlation to happiness from the genes? Like what exactly yeah. is going on there? Yeah, it's so interesting. So, you know, so basically we turn on and off genes all the time, right? And so like you spoke to epigenetics and it's such an interesting field and I'm by no means an expert in epigenetics, but we do know that what we consume and who we surround ourselves mm -hmm. with and the thoughts we think and the feelings that we have on a consistent basis turn it on and off these genes. Yep. And so when you start to think new thoughts, for instance, or you start to read or consume new material or you start to, start to take new healthy um, action in your life, you start to rewire your brain. And we do know that after about 66 days of taking action that's healthier or happier, you begin to rewire your brain for a much happier, healthier experience of life. And all of a sudden, it begins to ramp up and snowball in a way that you couldn't have foreseen before that, right? You experience a little bit of a butterfly effect. So the right. idea is to make very small but manageable and actionable steps in a daily basis to prioritize consistency over intensity. Lots of us try to tackle this happiness thing right away. and We try to be, go from zero to 100, you know, in terms of happiness. But you really just want to chunk it down so that you can take very actionable steps on a daily basis, be consistent, do it for the joy of it, not because you're trying to get some result. And you'll find that in about 66 days, the thoughts that you begin thinking and the new material that you begin consuming and the new action you begin taking begins to take on a life of its own and it becomes automatic and organic. And it feels like second nature to be happy or to be at peace or to be loving or self-loving. And so wow. really, the, um, the work really is in just identifying sort of what those steps might be for you. But generally, we find that pretty much everybody um, finds success and increasing happiness by taking similar uh, steps. Yeah. So your book, Happiness from the Inside Out, which when I heard, you know, obviously this is Inside Out Health, I was like, oh, <laughs> yay. Perfect. Speaking, We're in alignment. Yeah. Speaking my language. So you talk about eight tried and true principles for having happiness in your book. Do you mind sharing some of those with us? Sure, of course. So, you know, I'm a big believer in um, lazy intelligence. So lazy intelligence <laughs> is the idea to not work smart, uh, harder, but to work smarter, right? Yes. So how can we get equal or better results in our lives with less time, energy, and effort, right? And so yep. the idea there for me is that, look, everything that we want to achieve, accomplish, or acquire, we only want to achieve, accomplish, or acquire because we think we'll feel better for having it or for acquiring mm -hmm. it or for accomplishing it. And so if you can begin to turn this sort of notion on its head, this notion that if I become successful, then I'll be happy, and instead prioritize happiness over success, even happiness over love, you'll quickly discover that you can get a lot better results in all areas of your life, including happiness, but love and money and health by just simply putting happiness first. And so the very first mm -hmm. principle really is about putting happiness first and realizing and recognizing that there are easier, more effortless, more enjoyable ways to be happy and to accomplish your dreams than by doing it the way we've mostly been doing it, which is routing all of that through other people or other mm -hmm. things or mm -hmm. new, you know, cars or new houses. It's great to have all of those things, but at the end of the day, those things don't provide the kind of happiness that we expect them to provide. I love that. I've been calling this um, Marie Kondo, your mind. <laughs> you know, the, does this bring me joy? Does it bring me joy? If it doesn't, it's got no business in your mind. We don't have to, you know, I think, especially, you know, I'll use health coaches as an example. There's a million different things you could do. It's like you could be vegan or you plant based, you could be keto, you could be carnivore, you can do all these different things. Does it bring you joy? Is it bringing you joy? Like that. Yeah. To, 
that's what I always, I'm bringing it back. You know, I love lifting weights. I love being in the gym. It brings me an insurmountable amount of joy. And it isn't hard for me to get my results because I love it. You know, so it's, I think it's about finding those things. And that's what I'm hearing you say is prioritizing. Does it bring me joy? Does it make me happy? I love what you're saying so much. I love your energy and I just, I just love everything. I'm really, I do. And, um, you know, I call it discipline, right? It's discipline. I used to be oh, yes. so disciplined growing up where I would do things that I hated. And then it felt like I was never quite getting the results I wanted. And I was miserable all along. So it was a miserable journey and a right. miserable destination. And I found that I needed to turn that on its head and really prioritize enjoying myself as much as humanly possible while I was trying to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Yes. And I found that not only did I have a happy journey, but I had a happy destination that I got to much more quickly simply by being disciplined instead of disciplined. Love it. I love that term. And I've experienced myself. Um, I just actually posted on my Instagram today. You can either hate yourself fit or you can love yourself fit, but just know when you get there, you're going to have the same emotion. It's not uh -huh. going to change. Exactly. Right. So, discipline. Oh, I love it. That's why people say, wow. Like, you know, sometimes people be like, wow, you got a lot of muscles on your arms. Like yeah, that must take a lot of work. And I'm like, mm, yeah, so it doesn't really fun. feel like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, and this is so, there's a key, there's a master key there to life. You're absolutely right about it. Like, you know, I'm of the mindset, who knows? No moment is guaranteed, right? I mean, no moment is guaranteed. Even this very moment we're in right now, it's not guaranteed. And so knowing that, and also knowing that everything that I accomplish and achieve and acquire, I'm going to have to give back one day anyway. You know, mm -hmm. that takes everything away. Knowing that, I want to do everything humanly possible to enjoy as much of my day and as much of my life as I possibly can. Right. right? And then when you find out that by doing that, you're more in what we call a psychological state of flow or the zone, you know this being an athlete, that when you're in psychological state of flow, you're 500 to 1,000% more effective, efficient, and efficacious at whatever it is you happen to be doing. And it's so much more enjoyable. So that means that what normally would take you a year and a half to do, you can do in one day if you just stay in the zone the whole day, right? Now, that's not always possible to stay in the zone the whole day, but that's the idea, that there's something right. incredibly magical and miraculous about being in this flow state that is characterized by enjoyment. Beautiful. I love it. Yeah. That's, you know, and, and we can create this in our lives. Like I have learned to create flow state and it happens for me in the gym, right? So I get that dopamine, that adrenaline, all these chemical concoctions, I get in flow state. So I give myself two hours in the gym every day, not to train for two hours, but because once I'm in flow, I get shit done at an astronomical rate. So all of my creative juices for social media sharing, for um, business partnerships that I might want to align with those, that all happens while I'm in that flow state. So if we can learn to create this, you know, through practice, through discipline, we, then if we can prioritize the things that matter most in our life during that time while we're in flow, like imagine how much quicker your life can get astronomically faster than sitting there trying to grind away and force it. And this is hard and I don't feel like doing this right now. And that. I mean, of course we're all going to be in that state sometimes, you know, we can't always, but if we can focus that energy while we're in flow, man, I love what you're saying there. Yeah. And I love what you're saying. I mean, it's so powerful. What you're saying, there's um, if you remember the guy that broke the first, um, that ran the mile in four minutes, the first guy, Roger Bannister, you know, yeah. he's well known for saying, you know, when they asked him, they said, "Hey, Roger, how did you do this? We thought that you that the per first person who ran the mile in under four minutes would die. Like they we, they literally thought we would die. They'd have an ambulance lined up and everything like that. Every time <laughs> we tried to break the mile, this guy broke it. They said, "How'd you do it?" And he said, "The secret to running fast is to relax, you know." And so that's an invitation for all of us to sort of relax wow. inside while we go about doing whatever it is we're doing, and you're surprised that when you relax on the inside a little and you try to have more fun doing it and try to enjoy yourself more, you're a heck of a lot better at whatever it is you're trying to do. And all of a sudden, you're not only enjoying yourself, but you also find better results. So I just love what you're saying. Wow, that's such an incredible insight and such a, like the exact opposite of what you think he would say. Yes. <laughs> I mean, no pain, no gain. It's like, you wonder why your whole life is painful. Right. Wow. Such a powerful thought. Okay. So what else? So we prioritize happiness. Okay. What, what, what other tips do you have? So that's the first thing. The second thing that I recommend it, this is a little um, outside of the domain of sort of a positive psychology, um, which is just creating a happiness list, like a happiness islands list. Mm. So you'll notice there are certain things, activities, people, places that with very little time, energy, or effort allow you to feel uplifted, enlightened, uh, enlivened, and happy to be alive. You want to create a list of those things and just notice when you're more wow. tapped in, tuned in, turned on, easily and effortlessly so that you can spend more of your life on those islands, on those happiness islands, right? We each have some sort of different things and different people that allow us to do that. 
And then you can also look at your happiness values. Those are the things that with, very, with no matter how much time, energy, or effort you spend, you just don't enjoy or can enjoy. And so you want to do your best to outsource or delegate or reduce or eliminate all of those things. And if you can't at least outsource, delegate, reduce, or eliminate, at least explore the opportunity of automating or regulating that, right? So it's what we kind of do with our bills, right? We have the bill pay, automated bill pay, but that's the same idea. And so that's sort of the second step is just notice the activities that make you feel alive and happy to be alive and see what you can do to spend more time doing those things and see what you can do to get the other things that happen as valleys or happen as vampires off your plate, so to speak. Wow, that's such a powerful thought because I know you've worked with like top institutions like Microsoft and TV producers and published authors and Oprah endorses you. I mean, the list goes on, but it's such a novel thought because what I have learned as a business owner is that once I've identified what I'm one, not really that great at doing, which I just think I'm not that great at it because I don't like it. (laughs) I think if I liked it, I would be great at it, but I don't love doing like clerical type work, but there are some people, you know, as a business owner, because I've identified that when I hear somebody say, I love organizing, I'm like, really? Let's talk. Come on over here. You know? So, but you can't have that until you've actually identified those things. So I can only imagine, I think, you know, I think of my kids, I always look at my kids as my first organization, right? They're like my practice training ground for my business. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, some of them actually really like cleaning the bathrooms and some of them actually really like doing the dishes better. So like, let's put them in the roles that they like doing. So we don't have to have so much, um, abrasive tension all the time. And I'm sure that's what you're doing in those organizations. I would assume. Absolutely. You just nailed it. I mean, and you, I love the way you sort of contextualize that was so beautiful. Like you're absolutely right. Like the beautiful thing about this entire teaching really around happiness is that first of all, you're prioritizing happiness. So you get to enjoy your life a lot more, but you also are identifying your personal brand, both as a professional, but also just as an individual. And the idea is really to spend your time in that overlap between your happiness items and say your success items, which you just pointed out, that's your personal brand. That's where you're going to shine most brilliantly and beautifully with the least amount of effort. Mm -hmm. It's where your comparative or competitive advantage is, is in that overlap in that sweet spot. And so ideally you want to spend your life there as much as humanly possible. When you're in your sweet spot, that's when you're also much more likely to be in that flow state. And you're also going to find much better results with less time, energy, and effort. Again, it comes back to lazy intelligence, but that's precisely the idea. Most of us focus most of our lives on the things that we hate or the things that we're really weak at, but all the science has shown that you don't become extraordinary that way as an individual, as a family, as an organization, you become extraordinary by focusing on and identifying and leveraging your signature strengths. It makes so much sense. Like it makes so much sense, but none of us have been raised that way. So it takes some, uh, some deprogramming of our brains and choosing this, you know, it's, it's, why is it, do you think that it's like, it's almost scary for us to go there. It's almost scary. It's like, it's like, we're not allowed. <laughs> we're not allowed to go there. What, what do you think holds people back from being able to make that jump? Yeah. It's such a great point. I mean, there's so many, um, we, we could talk about that. So many, I would say that the very root of it really is a mind that doesn't love to change, right? The, the brain doesn't love, it doesn't particularly love change. It, it really optimizes for efficiency. Okay. So sometimes it's hard work to change, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's great that it optimizes for efficiency. That's what keeps us alive and allows us to survive and not just waste you know, all this energy on things that don't make a whole lot of sense or don't matter a whole lot. So part of it's that, and yes, you nailed it. It's programming, conditioning, you know, this sort of idea that there's no pain, no gain, you know, and that the idea that we should have to work our way through and grind our way through everything. And that's for a good reason, because oftentimes if we're just coming out, let's say cave woman and cave man days, yes, there were days and weeks, maybe months when you really had to just, you know, dedicate yourself to doing something that was just horrific. Right. And, you know, whether it was farming land, whatever. So the idea is that, yes, it's programming, it's conditioning, but also the mind is built in such a way that it seeks to solve problems. This is a problem solving instrument. But part of that challenge with an instrument that's designed that way is that it validates its position the same way as a century of a ship does by looking for problems to solve. If it can't find a problem to solve, it will literally create a problem to solve. Right. And so the mind and the brain is very problem oriented, which can be a very good thing. But in the when, when the problem it can't be sort of identified right away, it will actually create one. So that's why we've got in this brain something called a negativity bias, right? We've got a negativity bias and it, for whatever reasons, really prioritizes negative experiences, negative events and problems because it seeks to solve those problems so that it can help you survive, right? And so it requires more effort often 
to focus on that which is positive, that which is helpful, to put enjoyment first, because there's something sort of inherent about human beings that just at some level feels that that won't work and that won't lead to success. So it's understandable, but in some ways it's outdated. Wow. I love that insight because it's, you're embracing what the mind does as a tool. It helps. It's like, I, I appreciate you mind, but like right now <laughs> yeah, right you're not, in, you're not in charge. Okay. <laughs> like we're actually going to choose positivity. Wow. To think that I love that um, phrase of negativity bias in the brain purely because that's what it's supposed to do for us. It is wonderful. Thank you for helping me problem solve brain, but you don't have to do it all the time. Like <laughs> let's turn you know, it down. Exactly. <laughs> Beautifully put, because the idea is, you know, we know from positive psychology that ideally you want to be at least at this, we call it a positivity ratio. It's three positive experiences for every one negative experience. The idea is not, you don't have to get rid of all the negative stuff. You're never going to be able to do that, but you want to at least be around three to one in terms of positive experiences to negative experiences. Most people hover right around two to one. And that's just a little subpar. And so, and ideally, predicting in terms of a relationship, you want to be almost at 18 to one. Right, so you want to really optimize your life for increasingly positive and uplifting, and um, you know, enlivening experiences. And you want to do what you can to not always be focused on problem solving. You could spend your whole life problem solving, but it won't necessarily lead to a life of enjoyment. Wow, wow, I love this. This is such good stuff. Oh, like my soul just like gets so like I'm like on, I'm like on the edge of my seat right now. Just like yes, okay. So, what other principles have you got for us for yeah. for true happiness? Yeah. So, you know, I think if I were to reduce it all down, you know, the one thing that positive psychology would say over and over again, of course, is that relationships really matter. They matter a lot. Mm. And, um, you know, it's so interesting because we have this idea that being happy is selfish and it's just not. All the science has found that the happiest people are the most generous, they're the most kind, they're the most loving, they're most giving, really. They donate the most blood, they donate mm. the most money. And so happiness is really your gift to the world, right? And so you being ha- happy and prioritizing your own happy happiness and being sort of selfish about that allows you to be finally unselfish in authentic ways, organic ways, where it's no longer a question of giving to receive back. You no longer give with strings attached or give with an right. expectation of reciprocity. You just give because it's so much fun and so enjoyable to give. Right. right? And so, um, you know, part of this requires us, you know, really prioritizing our happiness and being selfish about that, maybe eliminating people that aren't necessarily contributing or supporting us in that. But it also means spending time enjoying the company of other people. And, you know, it's very difficult for most people to be happy when they're alone. That doesn't mean romantically alone, but just alone in general. No, no man or woman is an island necessarily. And so relationships matter a great deal. Now, there's something else they found, which was this, is that not only does happiness contribute to your being loving, but your being loving and generous and kind contributes back to your happiness, mm-hmm. right? So you get this like positive upward spiral. And so mm-hmm. relationships matter a great deal. I think if I were to summarize sort of the entire, you know, teaching that I offer, it'd be that you want to increasingly do happy things, right? You can't, it's very difficult to be happy if you're doing unhappy things, right? So you want to prioritize happy things. You want to prioritize happy thoughts. So the idea there is to begin telling a better feeling story based in truth about everything and everybody in your life. You want to do that with yourself and with everybody else. That's critical, really. If there's one thing you really want to optimize for, it's beginning to tell yourself and everybody else a better feeling story about everything in your life, but based in real truth, right? Every stick has two ends, a positive end and a negative end. You can focus on the positive end or the negative end. But I promise if you focus on the negative end, you're going to feel unhappy and you're also going to be less creative at finding solutions. Um, so there's doing happy things, increasingly thinking happy thoughts, right? Telling a better feeling story based in truth. And the last thing is also practicing not thinking at all, right? And so mm-hmm. most of us get down this path and we start, you know, basically surrounding ourselves with people that are increasingly happy. And we do that okay. And then we increasingly try to outsource or delegate, reduce or eliminate things that aren't necessarily happy to do or we're not very good at doing. And that's great. And then we become sort of obsessive about always thinking positive thoughts or always thinking happy thoughts. But that in of itself can be extraordinarily stressful and anxiety provoking. And so there's a third step, which Mm -hmm. really is all about being more present and practicing the presence, which essentially means letting your mind be wherever your body is as consistently as humanly possible. That means unitasking. That means doing one thing at a time. It means turning things that are normally a means to some other end into an end in and of themselves. So if you're swiffering, can you just swiffer? If you're doing the laundry, can you just do the laundry and try to enjoy doing the laundry without being obsessed about getting it done right right away or so fast or be obsessed about all the other activities you have to do? Just be present. So it means keeping your mind where your body is. But beyond that, also keeping your mind quiet, you know, Mm -hmm. keeping cool, calm, and composed as frequently as humanly possible. And then you often discover that within that quiet, 
is this peaceful aliveness. And that peaceful aliveness is something that doesn't come and go, it doesn't visit and then leave. It's there at all times, even when you're stressed, underneath the stress is this peaceful aliveness that exists within you, really as you. And so you wanna spend more of your time sort of connecting with that feeling or experience of peaceful aliveness that I call true happiness, it's unconditional happiness. Wow. I love that. I mean, I've definitely experienced in my life, the power of letting go of thoughts. And I think that came to me through meditation. And I'm curious if in your research, meditation has come up in in happiness research. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we do know that that meditation increases the gray matter in the brain, right? And so you essentially uh, think more creatively and productively and more effectively and efficiently and sort of depending on what you meditate on, that area of the brain will actually grow to support more thoughts and experiences in that way, right? So if you wow. meditate loving kindness, for instance, you'll tend to actually not only experience more loving kindness within yourself, but as you look out into the world and you go out into the world to live, work, and play, you experience more loving, kind people and more loving, kind experiences. It's fascinating, right? Mm-hmm. And so the idea there really is that whatever you sort of meditate on or meditate about, it often increases your experience of that very thing. That's why I mostly love meditating on sort of the nothingness that is just my feeling or experience of being alive, just the noticing right. that sort of naked awareness of your own existence, where there's no thoughts in that at all. There's just a feeling of energy, non-physical energy in the body, just spending time with that, breathing into that. That in and of itself for me has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. Same here. You know, what? It, something on that line, on that note that's been coming to mind lately is remembering when I was a little girl by myself wandering around in my yard if you can get your place into that, do you just remember, I remember just seeing the dandelions or the tree and just being completely and totally present. That's the state that I'm always searching to get back in. And I feel like that's what happens when I do that is now my brain isn't so cluttered on the past or the future that I'm blocking anything from coming in. I'm in complete receptive mode. That is so brilliant and so beautiful. My goodness. I just love that. And that's the idea, right? When we talk about childlike faith, what is childlike faith other than living in the present moment without too much fear or any fear and any desire, really? You're just in enjoyment. Enjoying, let's say, for you when you work out or that I do when I work out or when I meditate, it's just doing it for the joy of it. In that joy, in that presence, there's no fear, there's no desire, there's just presence itself. And you're right. I mean, that's childlike faith, it's wonder and awe. And that brings us actually to another positive psychology tip and trick really is to notice and be intentional about noticing things that make you feel a natural sense of wonder and awe about life, right? So Mm. beauty often does that. Pleasure does that. Pain sometimes does that, believe it or not. It quiets your mind, brings it to a still point where you're just so in the moment and so present. There is no worries about the future. There is no worries or regrets about the past. You're just very present. And so the idea there, again, is coming back to the present moment and enjoying things for their own sake without being lost in discursive thought. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so what are some of the blocks? What are the, some of the biggest barriers you see that block people from just feeling the happiness that is innately, inevitably all around them? What blocks them from feeling and seeing it? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think in Robert Holden, who's a positive psychologist, she talks really eloquently about this. We have these happiness contracts in our head that tend to stipulate when and where and why, <laughs> if at all, we deserve happiness, right? And so wow. we've got these ideas about happiness that block happiness. And so the things that we often think are opportunities to be happy end up being obstacles to be happy, right? So the things in the future, for instance, that we think about being opportunities to happiness. So that wow. new job, that additional money, that weight loss, whatever it is, we think of those as opportunities for happiness in the future. When in reality, there are obstacles to, to happiness right here and now, right? Wow. So we've got these ideas in our head. A lot of those are inherited for the most part. It's programming, it's conditioning. But these, these contracts have little stipulations in them like, you know, you need to earn your happiness or you need to deserve it. But for sure, if you just look at little kids, little kids often are very happy for no good reason, you know? And they're happy without a whole lot of thinking, without a whole lot of doing. They're just happy. And so we want to drop the programming, as you mentioned, and drop the conditioning and spend more time in this place and space where there is no happiness contract. Um, But sometimes that first requires us exploring or digging in to the happiness contract to sort of unveil, unveil or reveal what that happiness contract is stipulating that we must do in order to earn or deserve happiness, which is always a lie, really. 
Wow. A lot of what I'm kind of getting from you is like letting go of these expectations on happiness as well. Like whether that's our meditation and we're like, okay, I'm going to meditate and this thing is going to come out of it. It's like, nope, just clear your mind and let it go. Or, you know, what was coming to my, my mind, totally guilty. Um, I'm, I'm glad you said it. Cause I thought about how many times I planned some event with my kids. Like we're going to go up into the mountains and it's going to be amazing. Or we're going to go on this trip. And I spent all this money and I worked so hard. And now you guys are fighting in the back seat and you're ruining <laughs> it, you know, and it's like, so maybe instead of that expectation of I'll be happy when it can be like, maybe I can just listen to what they're actually talking about, you know, instead of just trying to reject it away. And then maybe we can find happiness in that moment in the car ride over to the mountains. That is so profound. And that's a good reminder, I think for all of us, and especially for parents, which is that, you know, sometimes we all get attached to things or experiences or people or places that we think will offer a greater opportunity for happiness than the present moment. Mm -hmm. That's always also a lie, right? That's always also an illusion. Um, the only moment that we ever can access happiness is in the present moment, always and forever. Even when the future arrives, it arises another present moment, right? It's yep. the present moment again. And so the idea there, particularly for parents, is to do what you did so beautifully um, well, so elegantly well, which is let them see you upset and then admit that you're feeling upset and then let them see you work your way back up the emotional scale. Let them see you self-soothe and emotionally regulate yourself mm -hmm. and bring yourself back to a place of center and peace and presence again. That's one of the greatest gifts you can ever offer your kids mm -hmm. is modeling and embodying and teaching through your living, shining example, how to self-regulate, how to emotionally regulate, how to self-soothe. It's way better and more helpful to them than them finding or getting to this destination that ends up being so super happy that they now feel attached to replicating that experience their entire lives. But, right. Right. So what you did there was so beautiful is bringing yourself back to the present moment and being the change that you want to see in your kids and then teaching them through your words and your action that you can make yourself feel better. And it doesn't require anything or anybody else outside of you. Wow. Wow. Thank you. So well said. Okay. I'm curious. I just have to ask this question on a personal level because, because <laughs> I've been, I've been married. I've lived like the American, like, you know, like what everybody wants, right? Like I've had the married with the four kids with the big yard and the house and the boat and the truck and the minivan and like that, that whole life and the trips to Disney world and like all that I've lived that life. I've also now lived like the single life where I'm a single woman. I work for myself. I, you know, and it's, I'm curious if there's research or in your experience and working with people, if there's any correlation to happiness with being in a committed partnership relationship. Yeah. Yeah, um, not, not so much. I mean, most statistics find mm -hmm. that, you know, um, single people and married people tend to be about equally happy. Okay. What's inter what is interesting about the research is that, um, so happy people do tend to get married earlier, stay married longer than unhappy people. And they're happier in all the relationships, whether they're married or not. Mm -hmm. And that's the key part. And so mm -hmm. really, it always takes two people, two happy people, two independently happy people to make up for a very happy relationship. Right. And so at the end of the day, I would say that the opportunity to be happy is equal, whether you're single or in relationship, you know, yeah. um, now that being said, I will say that for those folks who are in relationship or interested in relationship, that one of the best things you could do for your dating and relationship life is choose someone who's as happy or happier than you, because generally the happiest person does not pull the least happy person up in terms of happiness, but instead the least happy person pulls the happier person down in terms of happiness. And so you want to keep that in mind that if you, you know, connect with someone and you end up dating or married to someone who's unhappy, it's very difficult to maintain your own happiness in the face of someone who's really not happy at all. Yeah. I had a lesson from the universe on this one for sure, because I found, um, <laughs> actually I'll share it with you if you don't mind real quick. Like I was going for a walk around the lake by my house and I felt very intuitively guided to go walk around the lake and it was a little cold. It was like early spring. And I made it make maybe a quarter mile max. And I was like, never mind. It's too freaking cold. I can't, <laughs> I can't make it. Like, I guess I'm just crazy. I don't know. I'm just going to go back home. So I started like, you know, walking real fast back towards my car. And all of a sudden the sun, the sun breaks through the clouds and it just warms me up to the point that I am so comfortable that I feel like I could stay there for much longer, stay there forever. 
And the thought that came in intuitively in my mind is be careful who you're dating because you are a sunshine soul, Tara. And I'm, I'll own it because this is what yes. came in. It's like, you are a sunshine soul. So when people are in darkness, they're going to feel attracted to that light. But have you considered what what a sunshine soul in a man looks like? Have you considered that Tara? Like, do you even know, have you even identified what a sunshine soul and a man looks like? And I was like, wow, it was a really profound experience for me. And I thought, you know, if you, let's say you are very positive and very happy that I learned that can be very attractive to somebody who's not in that place. And if you get joy out of bringing happiness to others, you can find yourself in situations sometimes that are not in your own best interest. And that was something that I had found. And so I just thought I'd share that for anybody who's, you know, in the dating world or whatever, and you're, you know, in this positive psychology, just be aware if that helps anyone. So powerful. I love you saying that. I so appreciate you sharing that. Um, I get so much from that. And you're so right about that. I think we've all, particularly of those of us who um, love and are or aspire to be sunshine um, souls, the way you described, which I just love. Um, Because Sometimes for some of us, there's a bit of a savior complex, right? There's yeah. a group of fix, we love to help, we love to support. And part of that, we're falling victim to the very same thing that the other person who's attracted to that, who's coming from a darker place, is it, you know, th- that they're falling victim to, which is this idea that I can find more happiness in someone else or by someone mm-hmm. else or through someone else. And, our, and for, for, for the, from the Sunshine Shoals perspective, we think of it as, well, I will help them find happiness and that will make me feel happier or that will make, give me purpose. And mm-hmm. it's the same thing they're doing. They're trying to find happiness through you. And so that's the challenge and opportunity. I think we've all fallen victim to that. I've always mm-hmm. been one of those people who wants to help the broken, you know, little bird and always, you know, and, uh, and that's not always necessarily our job and our duty. And also to a large extent by doing that, by being able to provide even a modicum amount of happiness to this broken bird, or this darker, you know, this person experiencing sort of this darker, more depressed experience of life, we often are doing the very thing that leads them away from the source of happiness itself, which is within them. You know, we're almost training them and teaching them, hey, depend on me right. for your happiness instead of depending on yourself and looking within yourself for the happiness that you seek. And so we want to be careful about that in terms of both relationships, but also just people pleasing in general. Wow. Powerful, powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, I'm also curious when you come into organizations, like, where do you start? What do you do with these people? Like what? Cause I, I mean, I've read the reviews on your website and like, I mean, they are powerful. People are like, I wish we could bottle them up. Like I w- wish we would have just found them faster. Like, what do you do? Like, how do you, where do you start with these guys? Yeah. So, um, the, the most important thing by far I've discovered in my coaching and you exemplify this perfectly is to be the change you want to see in other people. So whatever it is you're wanting other people to be in the world, be that full tilt, like full out. So like, Mm -hmm. I'm pretty bad at most things in my life. I can't do very many things well, but there's one thing that was life or death for me. And it's this happiness thing. You know, I was suicidal for years and, um, you know, I was depressed, very seriously depressed for years. And I would think about suicide Mm -hmm. more than I thought about anything or anybody in the world for years. Yeah. And so because of that, I sort of had this life and life, life or death mission around being happy. And for me, it's an ultimately selfish thing. So the very best thing you can do for anybody in the world is be the change yourself that you're wanting to see in them and to be it for selfish reasons because you just want to feel good. That's the most important thing. Emotion is contagious. We know emotion is more contagious than anything else on the planet, including any virus ever discovered, right? You can literally transmit emotion through the computer, through a screen, through the phone, through a text message. And so the idea is that's first and foremost. And second of all, where we usually start often is just an open, honest conversation. I'll begin to share a lot of the information and sort of surprising and dramatic findings from the world of positive psychology. I'll dive deep there. We have to nice take questions. But I also have an entire slew of positive psychology um, sort of assessments, a battery of assessments that people can take. Mm-hmm. Um, they're actually available through University of Pennsylvania's website, authentichappiness.org. You can take you know, tests on gratitude and relationship style and relationship approach and overall happiness and satisfaction and all these interesting things. But I'd say that by far, it's not necessarily the information that helps people. It's not what you say. It's what you are. It's what you demonstrate on a consistent basis. I think that is what people remember. And that's what's most helpful. Wow. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I found like, I love what you're saying about being selfish. It's like, you almost, you have to use that word, even though it's not selfish. It's like, you have to use that word. I tell it because I coach women, right? So I'm like, be selfish. 
right now, like be as selfish as you possibly can. It is the best thing you'll do for your relationship. It's the best thing you'll do for your kids. It's the best thing you'll do for your business. Um, cause I found, you know, there's this, like, especially with women, it's like our value is placed in how much we can do for others. Right. And so many women are caught up in this and then they become unhappy. And I think, you know, if you want to role model for your kids, for me, like I had to go through all the layers of like the guilt and the shame of getting divorced and, you know, the chaos that ensued and having to move different places. And I was just like, so ashamed. Right. And I was feeling so guilty. I'm like, I ruined my family because I chose happiness for myself. And, you know, and what I learned, what I learned from that, that was two things. One, if you're in that energy of feeling like you, um, should feel guilty for choosing self-love or choosing happiness, you're going to project that onto other people and they're just going to believe you. They're just like, if you, especially with kids, for example, if anyone's, you know, been divorced or something, if you're feeling guilty, that's what I learned. I did this though. So <laughs> just the yeah. school of hard knocks. Like if I'm feeling guilty about it and apologetic about it and all those things, they're just going to be, they're going to feel the same way. Cause they're going to absorb that emotion. Just like you're talking about. The other thing that I found is no, <laughs> with the biggest gift I ever gave my kids was the example of showing them how to go through hard things. Even if you have to, at whatever cost to choose your own joy, to choose your own happiness. And if there's, you know, people stay married for their kids and unhealthy situations. I'm like, that's not for your kids. Don't cop out and blame it on them. You just too scared to do it because the best thing gift you can ever give your kids is showing them how to be happy at whatever cost. So I love that you're saying like, be selfish, choose Preach, you. Preach, <laughs> woman. I love it. That was fantastic. You're absolutely right about that you couldn't have said it better really and you know you, you bring up something else which i think is interesting which is resilience right you're really teaching your kids resilience uh, to a large extent you know it's like how to frame or reframe things that happen to you in your life so that you can grow from them so you can bounce back from them and maybe bounce back better right and so there's an entire body of research around resilience and how you can build resilience in your kids and in yourself and in your friends um, or I can build resilience together as a team. And so what you did there was a perfect illustration of your resilience um, and you living it fully has allowed your kids to also pick up and learn as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I guess my last question, of course, people can read your book, Happiness from the Inside Out, if they want more information on this. But what would you say if somebody's listening, they're like, okay, yeah, I get it. Like, I want to be happy, but I don't know where to start. Where would you tell them to start? Yeah, so I'd say three steps, okay? One is identify the happy activities, people, places, and things. That, you're, that are already in your life and see if you can't do more of those things, okay? Or if they're not in your life, see if you can introduce them into your life. That's the first. second thing is thinking increasingly happy thoughts. And so instead of vetting thoughts based on whether or not they're true, vet them based on whether or not they're helpful, whether or not they're mm -hmm. supportive, right? right? And so that's the second thing you can do is just give up this idea that just because something's true, you have to focus on it all the time. That just doesn't work. You know, you can't be happy by focusing on unhappy things. You just, you know, you can yeah. focus on unhappy things in a happy way, or you can focus on happy things, but you just simply can't focus on unhappy things in an unhappy way and be happy, right? Impossible. So the third thing is this, is practice just doing and enjoying more things with nothing on your mind. It's probably one of the greatest practices ever. You know, you do it already naturally, probably in so many areas of your life, including working out, same thing with me. My workouts are like moving meditations because yeah. the whole idea the entire time is just to practice really one breath at a time meditation, right? Yeah. And so that's the third idea really is, and I'll call it micro meditation. So micro meditation is just one breath that you take as frequently as possible throughout the day with the simple and solitary goal of enjoying that breath mm -hmm. and not letting thoughts get in the way. You don't have to stop what you're doing if you're driving, if you're doing laundry, if you're mopping, you can keep doing what you're doing. But just see if you can take one breath and enjoy that breath like it's the last breath you ever take on the planet while you let your thoughts just pass through or pass by. And you'd be surprised that activities that are normally feel like nuisances or are super miserable, you'll find suddenly they have an aliveness they didn't have before. But of course, that aliveness isn't in the activity. It's coming from you. So I would say those are my top three tips. Wow. I love that. You know, that last one, um, I've taught similar, a uh, similar approach to eating with people who are these bottomless pits and emotional eating and binge eating. I'm like, just your job is to just enjoy every bite you went and you had donuts. I don't care. Like just, did you enjoy it? enjoy it and see how much more fulfilled you might not need seven of them. If you're enjoying every single bite, just enjoy, you know, and that's what I'm hearing from you. Every experience, enjoy the experience. And then you find that fulfillment. You find you that probably, happiness. Oh, just brilliant. I just, I'm so inspired by you. I mean that. And I love what you said there Thank because you. you're right. Like a lot of folks 
and I used to work in the addiction world for a while, mm. you know, you try to avoid the activity or you try to be completely absent. But often the key is to enjoy it by going way more slowly with it, being much more in your body than you are in your brain or in your mind. And then you find that instead of needing 14 drinks, you only need one and you're done. Or you only need one bite of the donut or you only need two donuts and you don't need 20. It's so interesting that to enjoy things more fully and more deeply actually solves for us a lot of the other problems that we think we have. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, this is so good. Guys, if you want to find out more, you can go to coachrobmack.com. Your book, um, is it on Amazon? Where's the best place to find it? Amazon? Yeah, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Okay, great. And I'll, I'll link everything in the show notes here, Rob. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing what you're doing, for being a light, the ripple effect that I'm sure you're having throughout these organizations and just getting out there and speaking. And guys, he's doing so much more. We didn't even get into it, but I'll, <laughs> I'll share in all the notes every, all, everywhere that you can find, find Rob. But thank you. Thank you so much for everything you've done and for what you're sharing with us here today. Oh my gosh, the pleasure is all mine. And I mean that you're such an inspiration. You're such a divine light and full of so much love and wisdom. And I feel so deeply grateful to have connected with you. And I mean that. So thank you so much for the work that you do. And thank you so much for who you are. Truly. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much.